live from Sin City, it's the Socks and Pinstripes Podcast. And now, here's the star of the show, Giant Dr. Griffin! Robbie Ray. This is Diet Dr. Griffin here, back with the second episode of the Socks and Pinstripes podcast. We made it through the first one, didn't get canceled. That's just amazing. But let's not beat around the bush anymore. Our topic of the day revolves around a guy named Robbie Ray. Robbie Ray is a former Cy Young Award winning pitcher with the Toronto Blue Jays. He signed a five-year, $115 million contract with the Seattle Mariners after winning that award on his free agent season. And he was recently traded to the San Francisco Giants. But let's rewind the clock a bit here. His last full season in Seattle was 2022, where he went 12-12 and and was fairly mediocre. His big claim to fame that year was giving up a game-winning home run to Jordan Alvarez in the playoffs because the manager thought it was a great idea to bring him in in the ninth inning to just blow the game instead of using a closer like a normal person would. Uh, uh, As an aside, I I never understand why managers feel like they should bring in starters into relief roles in the playoffs. It it just is completely baffling to me to do do something completely different than what they have been doing the entire season. You see it every year, it seems. And Dave Roberts, I'm looking at you. This season, though, this past season, was a complete disaster for Robbie Ray because in his first start, he gets blown up, gives up five runs, three of them earned, and you find out that he's injured and needs Tommy John surgery. Tommy John surgery is an elbow ligament replacement surgery. And it's something that is considered a rite of passage for pitchers. Every pitcher of note is going to have Tommy John surgery at least once. number of them have had them twice now. It's an increasingly common thing in the sport of baseball, like ACLs are in football. Reports are indicating that Robbie Ray won't be healthy to pitch until about mid-season of this year. I keep hearing July as the figure, but that is obviously subject to change. So why exactly would the Giants want to trade for somebody who's hurt? I guess before we dive into that aspect of things, let's look at the other two pieces that are involved in the trade. The Giants are giving up Mitch Haniger and his formerly ruptured testicle, along with Tony Descofani, who will forever be known to me as Tony Disco. If you're looking at the contracts, it's about a wash for this season. However, Robbie Ray has more money on his deal going forward than Hanniger and Tony Disco. Disco is a free agent after this upcoming season, and Hanniger has a player option. Meanwhile, Robbie Ray has an opt-out after this upcoming season, and then two additional years totaling $50 million. I would think it's highly unlikely that Robbie Ray, given that he's recovering from Tommy John surgery, would consider opting out of the contract. I just don't think that coming off of Tommy John surgery, he would be in a position where somebody would give him more money than what he's set to make. So we know that money isn't the reason that the Giants made this trade. Money is likely the reason, though, that the Mariners made the trade because it removes that obligation of them likely having to pay Ray for the next three years. Seattle has a nice crew of young pitchers, and Tony can support them 
And if he ends up having a good first half, they can ship him off at the deadline for a couple of small parts, which never hurts. Mitch Hanniger, on the other hand, is a power-hitting outfielder and someone who Seattle is extremely familiar with. His biggest issue has been that he has had injuries throughout his time, but Seattle knows him as he spent his entire career there prior to his move to San Francisco outside of his rookie year where he was in Arizona. So now that we know the Seattle side of the equation, let's pivot back over to the San Francisco side and finally talk about the elephant in the room, the reason that I suspect that they made this trade. And that is that players just don't want to play in the city of San Francisco. I mentioned this before in my last episode when Jun Ho Lee signed with the Giants and they had to overpay through the nose to get him. The reason I think they made this trade is because the city of San Francisco is the biggest hurdle in getting people to come and play for the San Francisco Giants. The organization itself is actually really well run. They have a lot of money available to spend. They've done a decent enough job at drafting and building a young group of players. I mean, this is an organization that managed to win 100 games a couple of years ago, of years ago and even had a better record than the L.A. Dodgers. That's not an easy thing to do when both of those teams won 100-plus games. The Giants know their stuff. The problem is, is that nobody wants to play in San Francisco. There is just this perception of the town, whether it's accurate or not, that it's unsafe and a lot of the wives of the players have expressed concerns about living there. Buster Posey mentioned this in an article with The Athletic last month saying these things. And it has shown the past couple of years where they have really, really struggled to get the big, big fish to come. Types of free agents that you will see them getting are usually the short-term pillow contracts. And for those who don't know, a pillow contract is a short-term deal with opt-outs after each year. So, for example, you sign a two-year, $40 million contract with an opt-out after the first season. On paper, it's technically a two-year contract, but the second year is basically there in case the player either sucks or he gets injured and wants to get another stab at free agency. For example, Carlos Rodon was a guy who signed a pillow contract with the San Francisco Giants. Mitch Hanniger basically had a pillow contract with them as well. The Giants almost had a big fish last year with Carlos Correa, but unfortunately that whole situation didn't go well because of something they found in the physicals related to his ankle and then... That whole situation exploded with the Mets and them looking at the same sets of records and saying, no, no, this isn't good. And then he eventually went back to the Twins on an even smaller deal. That deal that Correa had come to terms with with the Giants was for 13 years, $350 million. A serious overpay for a talented but often injured player. Correa, of course, hit 230 this past season with 18 home runs and about 60 ish runs and RBIs each. So the Giants may have actually caught a break by not signing Correa and his gimpy ankle. The Giants, though, 
have been in the market for all of the big free agents that have come through, whether it be Otani, Judge, Yamamoto, etc. over the past couple of years. And the offers that they have brought to the table have matched what they the players end up actually signing for or in some cases have actually exceeded what the player is actually signed for in other cities. Always a bridesmaid and never a bride. I have made numerous trips to San Francisco over the past 10 to 15 years. San Francisco is a town that I have a loving relationship with, even though I understand that what Buster Posey was mentioning is sort of a real thing. It's a kind of a grimy town now. The homeless issues there are legitimate. The crime issues there are legitimate. And I think it's only gotten worse in the past five years. There was a a funny story that I have about the homeless in San Francisco. Uh, Actually, there's a a number of funny stories that I have had about the homeless in San Francisco. Uh, On my very, very first trip to San Francisco, uh, we saw a homeless guy, and I was was going with uh, my best friend, Jeff, who is in the league with me, and we saw this homeless guy with a bag, and he was like smashing the light pole with the bag, like swinging it like it was a baseball bat. On, a, on another trip, I, a homeless guy spat on me as I was walking, just minding my own business. I, mean, I was wearing um, a soup Nazi t-shirt, and I don't know if he could actually read the no soup for you line on it, but I wonder if that was the case or not, but he did spit on me when I was walking, which wasn't nice. Probably the funniest homeless person story that I had was uh, when I was doing a solo trip. Uh, I was researching a book that I was writing with my with my friend Jeff called Friday Bloody Friday. It's uh, a really enjoyable book. I can put a link in the uh, description if you want to take a look at it. So I was down in Fisherman's Wharf. And I was waiting in line to get onto the trolley, which is something in my numerous trips to the Bay Area before that I had never done. And there was a homeless person peppering us in line, and he and he was just standing there asking all of the other people, and there was probably about like 20 of us in line or so. And he was like starting at five dollars and nobody was giving him money and then he started like going down in price and i don't remember what amount that he was at when he said this but he mentioned wanting to buy a fillet of fish at mcdonald's so on fortunately on the sad side i have seen some other things in the bay area on my travels that weren't so kind I think on the same solo trip, I saw a line of cars on a Sunday morning because I was going to watch uh, a football game at like a local bar and a number of the cars, like four or five in a row, all had their windows broken and it just wasn't particularly nice to see. And I, I have felt unsafe when walking around at night so unfortunately it's just something that some cities have to deal with i feel like detroit also has this sort of tax that they have to pay to get people to come and it's unfortunate especially with the bay area because it's a beautiful area Besides offering more money, I don't think there's anything that the Giants can really do to escape this situation as the problems are completely out of their control. They have a beautiful ballpark that goes into the bay. I I went there last year and it was a wonderful experience. 
Just don't go to a night game. Not a lot of uh, news to report in free agency this past week. Uh, Harrison Bader signed a $10 million contract with the Mets to help shore up their outfield. Chris Sale actually signed an extension with the Braves to guarantee his salary for 2025, along with adding a club option for 2026, which I thought was a little bit of an interesting move because Sale's health history is nothing to sneeze at. Hopefully in the weeks to come, we will get some more free agency moves. Uh, The big piece, or well, he's a kind of a big player, Shota Imanaga, well, he needs to sign soon because his 45-day posting window is closing on the 11th. So he needs to make a decision and sign with the team in the next few days. And possibly he may have already signed by the time you're listening to this podcast. Either way, we will definitely be talking about it next time around. And before we go, I just have one small note to bring up, and that is regarding a player named Michael Brantley, who announced his retirement yesterday. Brantley is a five-time All-Star outfielder and one of the best pure hitters in the game. He wasn't a big home run guy or a big RBI power guy, but he was consistently hitting for a high average and being a consummate teammate for all of those he played with. Had he had better health, he may have ended up being a borderline Hall of Fame player, but the injuries were just too much to overcome and... He spent much of the past two years injured with shoulder problems. I just want to wish Mr. Brantley well in his retirement, and I hope he finds a way to stay with baseball, whether as a hitting coach or a special consultant, executive officer, whatever role he can find with an organization. And that concludes this episode of the Socks and Pinstripes podcast. Look forward to talking to you again about baseball. And hopefully we'll have more free agent news to talk about next time. This is Diet Dr. Griffin signing off.